But first, we begin overseas, where the United States presence is growing in Europe as the threat of a Russian invasion into Ukraine looms. Senior members of the American military touched down in Poland early Saturday. President Biden is also sending thousands of troops to the region as a show of force. CBS News foreign affairs correspondent Christina Ruffini has the latest from the White House. In a precise and very public performance, Russian and Belarusian forces move in formation across frozen fields just north of the Ukrainian border. A military dress rehearsal for an opening night that may or may not come. American officials say they do not believe Russian President Vladimir Putin has decided if he will move against Ukraine. But a full-scale invasion would likely begin with airstrikes and long-range artillery, followed by airborne and armored advances on several fronts. But Putin is unlikely to launch an invasion during the Winter Olympics, where he is one of the few world leaders in attendance. His high-profile meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping ended in a joint statement that included one of Putin's key demands, an end to NATO expansion. We uh, strongly prefer that Russia choose the path of diplomacy and dialogue, uh, but if it does not, we are fully prepared. Uh, for the for the alternative. Meanwhile, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken met with his Polish counterpart, as American forces are expected to arrive in Poland as soon as this weekend. And 8,200 additional troops are on standby to reinforce NATO allies should Russia decide to put on more than just a show. U.S. military officials have said if Putin does decide to invade, it could mean as many as 100,000 civilian casualties and up to 5 million refugees in the largest conflict Europe will have seen since the end of World War II. But so far, both Russia and the U.S. say they're willing to continue pursuing diplomacy. Lana? All right, Christina, thank you. For more, let's bring in CBS News intelligence and national security reporter Olivia Gazes. Olivia, great to have you again. So let's start off with the American troops uh, in the region. What happens if Russia, in fact, invades Ukraine? What's the plan for American troops then? Sure. So what the U.S. announced this week was the additional deployment, deployment of about 2,000 troops, most of whom are going to be headed into Poland, which is a NATO member and which already hosts thousands of NATO troops on its territory. Another 1,000 U.S. troops currently stationed in Germany are going to move farther east into Romania. Both it and Poland border Ukraine, so these troops are essentially going nearer but not into the potential conflict zone. These deployments are all in addition to that previously announced 8,500 troops that are in a state of heightened readiness, but still stateside. And what the administration has sought to emphasize throughout this process is that none of these troops is expected to actually fight in Ukraine in the event of an invasion. They're being deployed purely for deterrence purposes and for the defense of NATO countries should the conflict spread beyond Ukrainian borders. Uh, that said, mm -hmm. of course, the U.S. and European countries have been steadily sending defensive military equipment into Ukraine, offering training. And so while U.S. troops won't be joining the Ukrainians at the front, the U.S. has been seeking to bolster Ukrainian defenses in the face of a potential Russian attack. So, Olivia, that's the part that I think is is confusing for folks, that President Biden said American troops are not going to be fighting if there is a Russian invasion, and yet we're seeing American troops go over there. So what role are they actually going to play? And, and then how does it work as deterrence if, if we're saying they're not actually uh, going to take to the battlefield? Sure. So they're going to be deployed as far east, you know, within these NATO members as they can be. And that's supposed to signal to Russia, listen, if you escalate this conflict, we are nearby and we are prepared to defend these territories uh, that belong to the NATO alliance. Of course, Ukraine not being a member doesn't enjoy the benefits of the Article 5 pact uh, that these other countries do enjoy. So while it is a partner that has been uh, getting some reinforcements from U.S. And, and, and NATO allies, it can't be privy to that uh, defensive coalition that, uh, that NATO members otherwise enjoy. Well, Olivia, European allies have also scheduled meetings with the leaders of Russia and Ukraine next week. Tell us, is de-escalation through diplomacy a feasible option at this point? Sure. So we're at a point where there are really two realities in tension, Lana. One is that Russia has maneuvered itself into a position where it has multiple options. Uh, it can launch anything from a small-scale invasion into eastern Ukraine 
to a massive invasion of the whole of Ukraine on several fronts and on very short notice. The second reality is that Russia is continuing to show up at these diplomatic conversations. It is continuing to be willing to talk. And that's in, ad in addition to these meetings with European uh, leaders this week, we are still waiting on a written response from the Russians to the U.S. proposal that was sent over there last month. So once Vladimir Putin signs off on that response, we'll get some more clarity on what is diplomatically still possible vis-a-vis -vis the Russians. All of that is encouraging, but, um, you know, Russia has been amassing more, not mm -hmm. less leverage over the past several months. It was especially evident yesterday, as sure. you heard, we saw this warming and deepening of Russia's strategic collaboration with the Chinese, the two releasing that lengthy joint statement that made very clear they're willing to partner in, in certain areas to serve as a counterbalance to the U.S. Right. So the more options that Russia continues to accumulate for itself, the more difficult it is going to be for Western diplomats to arrive at some sort of diplomatic resolution that will still satisfy Vladimir Putin. Yeah, it doesn't seem like either the diplomacy or the troop buildup have really made much of a difference in terms of de-escalating the conflict. Um, and Olivia, I want to ask you about something else. Our colleague Holly Williams anchored live coverage of CBS News from Kyiv, Ukraine Friday, and she detailed Russia's planning of staged videos showing an attack from Ukraine. You also have reporting on this. What are your sources saying and what does all of this say about Moscow's tactics? Sure. So the latest disclosures this week came from the White House and are based on uh, what they said was deep classified intelligence that Russia had plans to release this elaborately staged video of a Ukrainian-led attack on Russian forces that would use corpses and employ mourning actors to drum up outrage and create a pretext for an invasion of Ukraine. This concept of a Russian Russian created pretext for an invasion isn't new, but this the details of this rather elaborate pr plot to create a video are. And while it does seem pretty far-fetched, yeah. and there's been some well-placed skepticism among journalists in particular uh, to press the White House for more evidence that this is the case, we do know that Russia is pretty much a master of deception. It has plenty of experience in creating fake videos, in launching disinformation campaigns, and issuing propaganda that it uses to po stoke public sentiment. And so the administration is saying, we are telling you as much as we can tell you while protecting our sources and methods so that if Russia does go forward with this far with this plan, as far-fetched as it might be, we will have called it out and blunted its effectiveness, hopefully, in advance. Uh, Olivia, let's shift gears a little bit because I want to discuss your reporting on the mysterious illness called Havana Syndrome. The Office of the Director of National Intelligence released a declassified summary earlier this week. Tell our viewers what it said. Sure. So this was a panel that included scientific and medical experts from inside and outside the government. And they were looking specifically at what could physically be causing the symptoms that these victims are experiencing, which is ear ringing, nausea, really intense headaches, sometimes traumatic brain injury. And so they were examining a, a range of highly technical things like acoustic signals, chemical and biological agents, and various forms of electromagnetic energy. They were not looking into who or what have could have caused this, like a foreign government. And what they found was that victim symptoms could be plausibly explained by pulsed radio frequency energy or possibly ultrasound if somebody was holding it very, very close to a target. But they still said that information gaps about both of those scenarios exist. So this finding essentially reaffirms what previous studies have found about the plausibility of directed energy. And that's important because it kind of holds open the possibility that there's some nefarious technology or weapon at play here. Uh, but at, at the same time, it doesn't really, it's not super conclusive, and it doesn't really break any new ground in terms of explaining what exactly is causing these symptoms. It's still so mysterious. All right, Olivia, thank you. Thank you.